But in the guidance department, we do look at our, kind of what we do each year. And there is a strategy behind what we're trying to do. Similar to a teacher that has a curriculum in their classroom, there are certain areas that we, and certain things that we try to cover each year. Uh, this is kind of broadly what we do each year. Um, but we have specific tasks that we do throughout the course of grade 9, 10, 11, and 12 that kind of cater to those overarching themes. Um, and obviously, you can see where we are now in grade 11. Uh, we're talking about post-secondary planning. All right, and the counseling staff, they really all do take a lot of pride in developing plans for their students, whether it's a student going to college. As you know, we have about 90, 95% of our students that go off to college military, workforce, whatever the case may be, we want to make sure student feels comfortable and is empowered to make the decision as to uh, what's coming next after high school. So uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Ms. Diozzi, and she's going to talk to you about defining future plans. So um, previously, really beginning in freshman and sophomore year, we do start to talk to students about career interests. They take assessments like multiple intelligences and um, the do what you are on Naviance to help them even just figure out in what direction they might be leaning. Are you more of a math person? Are you more of an English person? And we help them try to understand what their preferences are, what their strengths and weaknesses are as learners, um, today was job shadow day, so some juniors probably participated in that. Um, and do you want to go to college? Now this, this evening tonight is geared toward kids who have made the decision to go to college. But we understand there's a vast array of other options um, that you could do instead of going to college or concurrently, such as enlisting in the military, working, um, going into a trade program, or even a gap year, which we'll talk about later on in the program. So we use the word college major, but we really mean sort of field of study or area of interest as well. So juniors, juniors already, pro already know this. I have already had really great responses from my juniors, who, some of whom are here. They're doing a very good job of checking Gmail for invitations of RSVPing to junior meetings. Um, we do expect you, once we start showing you college searches and the like on Naviance, to really use Naviance to research colleges, um, learn more about yourself, because ultimately we use Naviance to send your applications, to send your transcripts to colleges. Um, some of us also have Google Classrooms through which we assign things like the activity list, um, the counselor questionnaire. I occasionally post, I've posted a junior timeline for my students on Classroom. So it's kind of like a little spot where we can keep information for them. We also want you to try to carve out some time to do this. With our junior meetings, we give you some time each month. For me, it's monthly where we work on things like the common application or college searches. But we also want you to be looking at these things on your own time and also you know, developing your list of college. Right now, this can be overwhelming. It's a lot of information. But the goal is to narrow those lists more and more over the coming months. Um, and then we do really want to meet with you individually. We meet in small groups, but some students don't want to talk. You know, you don't want to talk about your own personal GPA or your own SAT or ACT scores. So we want you to meet with us by yourself so we can tailor that conversation to you. So Naviance is, is, is very important and not to be underestimated. Like any software, what you put into it um, you, is what you'll also get back. They've recently changed their entire format to be app friendly. So it's much easier to navigate on the phone, on the iPad. It's so much more user friendly for um, teens. We use it again for career assessments to look at college, to, to complete college searches, there are two different types of college search. There's a super match, there's an advanced search. All of this is under the heading Find Your Fit. And there's, there's really just a, lot of, a ton of resources there. We can also use it to figure out what are the odds of you possibly getting in. I'm going to talk about that in a couple slides from now. And then, yes, we connect the transcripts and applications to Naviance, and that's how everything's submitted. Because we do that, we also now have 
I'm doing the math, 13 years worth of previous admissions data on every senior class since the class of 2006. So we can look at trends, we can try to spot, use data to see who might be getting in somewhere or what colleges might be looking for. It's really, really useful software. So these are the things where, these are the factors that we want you to start using to reflect. Like, what do you think you want to study? I mean, if you want to major, this is extreme, but if you want to major in business and finance, you're not going to go to the Mass College of Pharmacy or Berkeley College of Music, right? You're going to find a college that offers the things that you want or even allows you to change your minds, mind or switch between majors. Where is it located? How far realistically, and this is a family conversation, do you want to go? And how far do your parents want you to go? A quick plane ride, is it real, do they really want you, is it okay to go to California or Texas? Is that too far away? Can you factor in the cost of airfare? Those are conversations to be had as a family. And then the size of the college also kind of depends on how you function in crowds. Do you, will you be okay in a lecture hall with 100 people? Do you want to have a certain degree of anonymity? Um, growing up in a smallish town, sometimes students really feel like they want to go someplace where they can just meet a whole ton of new people. Um, and then other students want a smaller school where the professors know them and text them if they don't go to class. And they want to know everybody and have everybody know them. And again, that's a personal preference. Cost is another huge factor, um, of course. That's, that's really big. Um, we want families to have honest discussions about affordability. We also want you to know, though, that a lot of colleges offer aid. On Naviance, you can also see sort of the net price of a college and use that to compare. Um, we always say, too, the public schools are cheaper, but the private schools have more money to give in scholarships. Are you going to live on campus or not? Again, that's another question. Of course, if you're going to school in California, you're going to live on campus. And then do you want special programs like a sport? Do you want to play division sports, club sports? Um, I've had students who have absolutely said, I want to go to a college with a marching band. I want to continue to play my musical instrument on campus, and that's non-negotiable. And, and we make it happen. There are hun you know, hundreds and hundreds of colleges that have that. Um, so again, all of these things can be tailored on Naviance to create searches. There are other search engines, too. I always say to students, too, whatever comes up on Naviance is great, but if the same college starts popping up on other websites like Niche or College Board, maybe you might want to start paying, to that, paying attention to that college if it keeps popping up. It's also important, too, that if something doesn't come up on your search, you're more than welcome to add it to your list. It doesn't have to be part of your search. Um, the College Board and the ACT have search engines, and then a lot of people, kids like to go to websites like Unigo, Niche, CapEx, which is where co current college students, current college freshmen give the inside scoop about how many kids actually are there on weekends, what's the party atmosphere, and um, they're pretty honest and they're, and they're pretty helpful. Google is Google's also great. You can just search for what you're looking for, put it right into a Google search, colleges that have XYZ. And then we have a blog with a ton of information and every time we counselors visit colleges, we post to our snapshots. We have our own impressions of colleges that we've visited. And then last but not least, the old-fashioned college fair. There's one at Arlington High School in April, and then the Shriners Auditorium, ha they have one in, at the Shriners in October. While you're looking at colleges, it's also important to figure out or to sort of guesstimate what are your chances of getting in. So we often talk to schools about reach real, to students about reach realistic and safety schools. Let's start with actually realistic. It's exactly what the word means. It means that your GPA and test scores match are in very close range with those of admitted students, either nationally or who went to Burlington High. And again, I said we have that data. A reach school is where your GPA is less, is, is lower than the admitted GPA. And of course, there are colleges like Harvard or Stanford that are a reach for the valedictorian. They're just reach schools. They're very competitive. 
Um, they have cultures where they try to match students and find an appropriate fit. And then we also have safety schools. A safety school is where your GPA and test scores, if they accept test scores, are higher than the average admitted GPA. You should want to go to your safety school. Safety school doesn't mean less than. It should be a school that you want to go to where you could be really successful, and usually you get the most money often from the safety school because they want students who have higher GPAs and SAT scores to come to their school and they might try to lure you with a really good financial aid package. So this is a scattergram from Naviance. It's a couple of years old and it shows you along the bottom are SAT scores and on to the left are GPAs. This is admissions data for three years worth of applicants from Burlington High School to New York University. The X's are kids who were denied. The green, way over on the right, there's a, there's a whole bunch of um, icons that explain what everything means. The green, green means that the student was admitted. If it's in a box, it usually it tells us if they applied early. If it's purple, it tells us if they were waitlisted or deferred. The X's are kids who did not get in. So you can see where their ranks and SAT scores fell. But the most important part of this is the little blue dot, the little blue person. That's me. That's my fake student. So it tells me that New York University is a real reach. And it's, it's really, a, does any, can anyone tell why it's a reach? SATs, right. My GPA is actually, it's, it's, it's kind of okay, because those kids on the right got in. But my SAT scores are really low. So this can mean I give up on NYU and I don't apply there, but it can also mean, oh, you know, my parents have been telling me I should do test prep. And maybe that means you need to work harder on your SATs or try the ACT. Um, this can give you a whole lot of information to make it worth considering. And then the next school is Framingham State. We have a lot more applicants. Again, green means go. Those students all got in. And the students with the red X's did not get in. And I'm the blue dot. So that is really a safe, realistic school for me to apply to. And you can look at scattergrams for every college on Naviance for the most part, as long as we've had at least five students apply in the last three years. Any, any fewer kids than that, then we start to get into areas of you'd be able to figure out who it was and what their SAT scores were, and that's, that's not confidential. Um, so these are the minimum requirements for admission. Luckily, for the Massachusetts State University system, their admissions requirements match our graduation requirements. Woohoo! So you can't miss with this. So immediately our classes line up with what they're looking for. So you match academically. And then as we get into more competitive colleges, they want to start seeing APs, dual enrollment, higher levels of math and science, um, long-term focus on a world language. Mrs. Smith is actually going to talk about this a little bit more. Rigor of schedule. And then each school will probably lay out their requirements on their website. In fact, they will. And also, they might have specific re um, requirements, for example, for engineering or for nursing or physical therapy or for a theater audition. OK, so one of the best ways to figure out if a college is the right fit for you, I know I used that term briefly, is to visit it. Uh, you can really get a lot out of a visit. How many students have visited a college yet? Oh, good, a few hands. Um, if you visited because of siblings, I always say go back and have your own visit. The college has probably changed a lot since your sibling went there, and you're, you need to go on your own tour um, and be sort of front and center on that. Colleges have tours. They also have um, a very important second half of the tour called the information session. That's when you sit and they explain things like um, what the average SAT score is or what kind of essays they might be looking for if they don't use the common application essay. You know, you can ask questions like, if I'm not an art major, can I still take photography on your campus? 
You can ask all those questions in the information session. I strongly recommend that if you go on an official tour, that you also go on the information session. Do we have open, there open houses in the packet or no? Not this year, um, but we can get you that information. You can also visit an overnight. Sometimes kids go and visit their friends, but it's important that you also do a tour where the admissions office knows that you're there. Sometimes there are overnights that are through the admissions office. More often than not, we hear about kids going to visit friends at, say, UMass Amherst for the weekend. You can also do a self-directed tour. If you're on your way to Maine this summer for a vacation, you can always just drive onto the Bates campus and drive around. I call those drive-bys. I do them a lot. So at least just get a sense of what the college feels like. So that can be a good starter. Um, and then last but not least, we want virtual tours, especially if you're looking at a college far away. It's perfectly acceptable to apply to a college in California or Texas without having visited. Um, and yet, the visit can be a, an important determinant in the application process. And that's something Mrs. Smith will probably talk about when she talks about factors for admission. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. So we were talking about, so far we've talked about you searching, you looking, you looking at what you would like. We're switching gears a little bit now, and we're going to talk about what colleges are going to be looking, what they're going to be looking for from you. So here are the kinds of things that, um, that colleges are going to be looking for. We're going to break this up a little bit. The main thing I'm going to talk about is transcript. And then other people are going to talk about standardized testing, SAT, ACT, or perhaps schools that don't require those. Recommendations, extracurriculars, essays, um, or electronic presence. I'll just briefly say for electronic presence, really, that's if you give out your website or your whatever, colleges may look you up. Don't have anything out there publicly that's going to embarrass you or your grandmother. So if that's pretty safe, you're OK. Um, for example, I had a student applying for fashion design and fashion business, fashion merchandising at Syracuse University, very big school for business and good school for fashion as well. And um, they mentioned that they, they gave a website out on their activities list that said that they do fashion blogs. Well. I happened to get a phone call from Syracuse University asking me, talking about this student, and they brought up the fact that they had looked at this blog. So just be careful and give it an extra eye with the electronic presence. Steph, did you want to talk about Zimi? We didn't add, this is really new to us. So another um, website is called Zimi, and that's a college controlled website where students are now encouraged through the common application or other applications, they can upload stuff about themselves. They used to be allowed to just upload a resume, and through Zimi, you are now given the opportunity to post links, videos, and just uh, it's just another way to share information about yourself in a different form. So Zimi may pop up on applications next year. Great. Thank you, Steph. Um, I wanted to mention that that uh, April, that uh, the college fair. That's what that is. It's rows and rows of colleges who come to visit college reps. So on each table, one end will be UMass Amherst, the other end will be UMass Lowell. Hundreds of them, and it's a great opportunity to get to know a little bit about what it means to major in business, or do you offer this, or can you do this or that. Questions that, as you're new will be very helpful in getting to know what you're looking for. Um, the Arlington Catholic one is April 1st. Uh, I believe that's, a, that's it's whatever that Monday is. I think it's April 1st at 6.30. And that's the closest one. Um, the next closest one that we know about is Boston, which is later on that week. I think it's April 4th, that Thursday. So just FYI, I'm pushing my students to try to make it there. Even if you just go and collect information, it's well worth your time, at least as an introduction. Yeah, Arlington High School. Oh, I said Arlington Catholic. Sorry, Arlington High School. Yeah, that might be a big difference. Sorry. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, so talking about transcripts. First of all, let me preface this by course selections are coming up. We are meeting, the guidance counselors are meeting with students next Monday talking about 
Um, just a reminder on how to read your transcript. For the, so for some of you, this might be a repeat. It'll be a repeat next week. But also talking about new classes and reminders about this or that. Um, and then there will be a chance to talk with teachers. And then after vacation, we'll have a, an assembly to remind students how to input their classes into Aspen. And they'll start picking them around, um, around March 8th. Typically, students take... Uh, seniors will take 32 credits, which is six classes plus gym or, or plus health. Now, that being said, if you are taking two or more AP classes, you can have a reduced course load and take study hall all year. That gives you extra, extra time to get work done. If you're taking three AP classes or more, um, you have an extra study hall where you, it's called a directed study hall, and you'll do different things like stress management, just periodically talk about um, how, you, how you organize yourself, and just when you're dealing with that big of a workload, it's just, that's, that's one of the benefits too. It's called a directed study, okay? Now, I'm sorry, Joe, go, go back one minute. So when you're picking your classes next year, I'm going to show you what the tr show you again what the transcript looks like in just a minute. But when you're picking your classes, this bottom comment's a, a, kind of a big deal because if you are looking to go into nursing or you're looking to major in engineering, UConn wants you to take chemistry and physics. Not all colleges want you to take the real physics, which is like the beyond freshman year physics. Not all not all nursing programs require that. UConn does. If you are majoring in any kind of engineering at UMass Lowell, they will want chemistry. So when you, do, when you go to the information session um, or you go visit a college, if you like, sometimes there are opportunities to meet one-on-one -on -one with um, an admissions rep. And that's a good time to say, if I'm majoring in business at Bentley, do I have to take calculus? Are you okay with AP stats? Are you okay with pre-calculus? Find out in business what you need to take. If you are majoring in nursing or whatever, find out. You can also typically find this out on their website, but that's another opportunity for you to get to know what you need so that you can adjust your senior schedule appropriately. Okay? So, as you're picking classes, here are some opportunities that you might find very helpful. You meaning the juniors in the room. Um, virtual courses. These are online, you, either VHS, Virtual High School, or Edgenuity. You can look at either website and pick classes from those. Interesting class, these are courses that are not, you can take classes that are not offered at VHS. Or they could be classes that there is a schedule conflict for, for some reason, and you would still like to take a certain something. Or it could just be something you want to do because it sounds really interesting, like Irish literature or infectious diseases. Um, things like that are on VHS. And how that works is you work online um, through a platform with a teacher from another school who could be wherever. It is not included in calculating your GPA, but that's not necessarily such a big deal. It's more of a big deal maybe here in Burlington, but colleges typically recalculate your GPA anyway. So they may or may not include that. If you're taking a VHS course, that's a, course, that's a question you may or may not be interested in asking about. Dual enrollment. This is a big deal for, on a lot of different fronts because most colleges, you will take four or five classes per semester. If you take a class, one of these classes in high school, AP Honors Psych, Honors Calculus, Latin V, Introduction to Programming, AP Lit, anatomy and physiology. At, these are all at the honors level other than the AP psych and lit. You will get, um, if you get at least a B, you will, get, um, you will get college credit for that class. And which means that instead of taking five classes a semester, you may have a really hard semester and want to take advantage of that and drop it down to four. So that would be very beneficial for you. Um, and also, when colleges are figuring out your grade point average, they give it a little extra weight that we'll talk about in just a minute. So let me show you what a transcript looks like. Here's what the top of the transcript looks like. So this is what 
we have to send to all colleges. Now, the, the trend I'm starting to see is a lot more self-reporting. You Especially if you look at colleges out in, like down south or out in California, especially the super big ones, they'll ask you to self-report. So as a senior, you may get a copy of your transcript and you'll report all these. Um, otherwise, this is what we will in guidance send to your colleges. Um, it's also called a permanent record because I think we have to keep it, what is it, legally 99 years? 60? Oh, it's a little less permanent than I thought, but either way. Um, so the top of the transcript just tells where we are. It gives contact information in case colleges want to reach us. It gives the weighted GPA. Now, when you get to college, um, it, the grade, it, it goes on the 4.0 system. A is a 4, B is a 3, 2 is a C, and D is a 1. So 4, A, B, C, and D. And if that's at the college prep level, if you take it at the honors level, we weigh your B becomes a B plus at 3.5 when we figure out. It'll still say B on the transcript, but when we weigh your grade point average, that's what goes into the weight. If you take an AP class, it will weigh in as a full point above. So your 3.0B becomes a 4.0 when we weigh it in for your GPA, okay? Now, we don't weigh the dual enrollment classes as a full point above, even though they're college credit. However, the state universities, that's how they will do it. So UMass Amherst, UMass Lowell, when they're figuring out your grade point average, that's what they will be, that's what they will be doing, okay? Okay, here's what your transcript looks like. 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade tells all the classes you took, all the levels you took, and the final grade. I point out final grade because if you are struggling, get help. We have peer tutors, we have other tutors, we have a math tutor, we have teachers who stay after school every day until 325, except for Friday, because who's staying after on Friday? Nobody. Um, and it tells what level you took, so it tells what levels you took these at. Now, what colleges are looking for, if you had a rough freshman year, that's one thing. But colleges are looking for trend. They want to see that you're on the upward trend. Um, Ms. Diozzi and I went to something by U Pitt, and one thing that U Pitt said was preserve your GPA. You need to know where the balance is between challenging yourself, because you're looking at highly competitive schools in like that extra weight or whatever. You need to know where the balance is between taking these hard classes and not killing yourself so much that you're feeling emotionally fragile. Know where that is. If you're getting C's and D's and AP classes and you're killing yourself, you need to find that balance when you go into senior year. Um, colleges are going to look at the classes you chose and see what you're passionate about. What do you love? Ms. Diozzi talked about taking a rigorous senior year. What that means, you want to have classes that show colleges that you're ready for the next step. You want to be doing well senior year and take classes that show that you are well prepared to take on that college load. Um, notice independent study. We also have students who work one-on-one -on -one with teachers and come up with something that they really want to study individually, whether it's art, whether it's studying the election in facial reconstruction, all kinds of different things, different things with the help desk and technology, all sorts of different things. Um, and some of the students that I have are continuing their independent studies into senior year internship, which, by the way, if you do take advantage of the internship, it will not be on your transcript. What happens is your third quarter grade counts for your entire second semester. So if, you're a, so if you have friends who are seniors, they better do really well third quarter because that's going to count for quite a lot. Okay. Um, okay. And down, it's just at the bottom. This is the bottom of the transcript. Just shows you the code. Okay. Um, to go along with the transcript, what we also send colleges is a school profile. The school profile um, just gives basic information: what kind of community we are, where we're located, um, what we require for graduation, 
um, what classes are included for dual enrollment, um, if there's where, where your child, what, different average SAT, or SAT scores or AP scores, that kind of thing. Okay? Now, and oh, by, I sh what I should mention is it's based on the previous year. So it's based on the year, the, the graduating class before yours. So, oh, it is. Um, also, if you want to get an idea of what the profile says about, you, about Burlington, it's on the guidance blog. Um, and also, one thing we also do show is we don't rank, as you know, but we do have a weighted GPA, which means that, uh, well, we have a weighted GPA, but this is the GPA range that we give out to colleges so they can at least get a ballpark of where your child fits into their class. Okie doke. And now, Mr. Adubato to talk about standardized testing. Um, just to kind of piggyback on what Mrs. Smith said, this GPA calculation, it, this is how Burlington High School does it. This is how we go about calculating the GPA. Uh, colleges, again, will recalculate the GPA based on the classes a student has taken. So they may adjust your, your Burlington High School GPA is not necessarily the GPA at a, at a given college. And not every college publicizes how they recalculate. The Mass Public Colleges and Universities, they do publicize it. It's on the, the Mass Higher Ed website. So they actually detail specifically how they recalculate. Um, again, this gives Burlington High School students and colleges a perspective of where a student falls within their class. So I just wanted to make sure I clarified that. <clears throat> okay. So standardized testing. It is a reality that uh, our students have to deal with. Um, I just want to preface this, and I met with sophomores and juniors a couple of weeks ago to talk about PSATs, um, and I really try to emphasize the fact that, you know, your results on standardized tests aren't going to define your, your future, okay? This, the standardized testing is really just one piece of the college application process. It's not the sole determining factor. Okay, so please keep that in mind. And then there's about 1,000 colleges now, 800 to 1,000 colleges and universities that don't require standardized testing. So there's a website called fairtest.org. That lists all the colleges and universities that don't require testing. Um, so you can certainly check that out. We do notice a trend. There's a couple of state schools in Massachusetts, actually, Salem State U and U Lowell. I don't know if anyone else is doing this, but if you have over a 3.0 GPA, you don't need to submit SAT scores. Okay, so I think there's a little trend in, in the sense that, you know, SATs or ACTs aren't going to necessarily determine, um, you know, your, your, your future in, in your life. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. So college admissions testing. We do at Burlington High School offer the PSATs. It's given to all sophomores uh, free of charge. And then juniors, we recommend they take it as well. So juniors that are here tonight, hopefully you took it in the fall. Um, the PSAT, again, it's a pre-SAT test, and I'll get into more specifics about that. This is more of a timeline. Again, PSAT, at the very least, is a practice. So sophomore year, it was a practice test. Junior year, again, it's a practice. We do use that data for a couple of different things, AP potential. Um, so the PSAT gives us data to see whether or not a student has the potential to be successful in an AP course. Uh, we also use it for, we now use it for dual enrollment. Um, Mrs. Smith mentioned dual enrollment. It's really, it's not open to every student, just to clarify. Students actually need to meet certain prerequisites to get into dual enrollment, uh, one of which is your, uh, the score on your PSAT English. You have to have a minimum grade in order to qualify for several of our dual enrollment classes, so we use it for that as well. And then the counseling staff uses the PSAT data to help students make decisions on uh, colleges to, to compare uh, their PSAT scores uh, in terms of developing a list of colleges. So SATs, juniors, uh, <clears throat> you'll be taking the SATs this spring, either March, May, or June. We really like to encourage students to go May or June, if you can. Uh, Pre-ACT pre test. So again, SAT and ACT, two standardized tests, two different tests. They are um, for colleges that... Um, you know, review student information, they will accept either the SAT or the ACT. Uh, ACT is much more popular out west uh, and down south. This part of the country, New England, SAT tends to be more popular. 
Uh, but nationally speaking, they're, they're actually students take uh, equal, equal amounts of ACT versus SAT. Um, so again, we like our students to take some of the pre-test, the PSAT and the pre-ACT, because it gives students the experience of each test and what the types of questions there are and things like that. So then you can kind of focus in and decide what test you want to take, whether it's ACT or SAT. So for example, I had a, a student, she scored very well on the pre-ACT pre and did not do great on the PSAT. So she was able to focus her efforts specifically for the, to take the ACT. She just didn't even worry about the SAT and she stuck with the ACT. So the pre-testing just allows you to kind of figure out, focus in on a specific uh, test. And again, senior year, uh, when the AP exams are offered in May, um, and then going into senior year, you can see SATs and ACTs um, are offered again. And most of our students are taking one in the fall, one in the spring of junior year, and then senior year. Um, and SAT has now added a test date in August that is new with just started last year. So uh, students uh, that maybe have a busy fall with athletics and, or other kind of commitments on Saturdays, the August test date is uh, gaining in popularity. Go ahead. Oh. So the differences between the two. So again, these are two different, first of all, they're, they're companies, they're two competing agencies. So they certainly do compete against each other. Um, SATs completely changed how they, uh, the administration process around testing, uh, probably about three years ago now, four years ago, um, you know, the SAT was a much different test. It's completely changed now. It's actually in more alignment than the ACT than it ever was. Um, but you can see, I'm not gonna read line by line here, but you can see the differences in time. The uh, ACT does have a science section, with the, which the SAT doesn't. It's really not science knowledge, it's more about science reasoning. Um, so it's not necessarily about your specific knowledge in science. Again, the, the reading comprehension around the science is more about science reasoning. Again, little difference in tests. Both have essay, essays that are optional. Uh, we, we encourage our students to take at least one standardized test with an essay. But overall, statistically, probably about, I don't know, 40 to 50% of our students aren't taking uh, the SAT with the essay. Next slide. So this is just kind of a, a, a pie graph. So it, it spells out um, the scoring system for each. So the SAT has two sections, uh, essentially a reading and a math. You, the most you can get in each section would be an 800. Okay, that would be the SAT. Um, and it kind of spells that out here. ACT. Um, you have to click on it one more time. So you can score between a one and a 36, okay? Both tests offer a subscoring, meaning you get an overall score and then you'll get a breakdown uh, of very specific content areas. Um, and, for, and this kind of spells out those content areas. I can tell you that on the PSAT, uh, students that have taken it here, if you access your, on, the scores are now available online, they've been available since December. Again, we had an assembly with the students to explain how to access those scores. The PSAT data really can give you some very specific information on strengths and weaknesses. Students, uh, junior parents and sophomore, or last year you probably recall, and this year, getting the test book the students used in the mail. So you have the test book, you have the, the test questions, or they're online as well, and you have the answers to those questions. And you can see in the score breakdown, where you were successful, where you weren't successful, and you can focus your efforts in on looking in those specific areas to see if you can um, you know, make some improvements. <clears throat> um, one other thing, and then this is, uh, again, another breakdown, just how the, you know, the, the math seems to be very similar, but you can see a little bit more geometry on the ACT than the S uh, SAT. Um, and, and so this kind of gives you a nice visual of the differences in the specific content areas, okay? 
The uh, information that we sent home, by the way, with the PSAT uh, score results, we did also send information home about Kaplan test prep. And if students were interested, uh, they would just need to shoot me an email or a parent would need to shoot me an email. And you can actually get uh, a significantly reduced rate on a Kaplan test prep course. Uh, the school department actually subsidizes the cost. So we work with Kaplan and the, you know, I think the cost of a class now is probably like between five or 600 bucks. But with the subsidy that you get, it's like 285. And uh, it's a, they offer eight live classes here at the high school. Uh, again, we sent out information about that. If you don't recall getting it, um, you can just check out the guidance blog. We have the schedule listed there. So the SATs, they offer also something called SAT subject tests. Um, several colleges used to require not only the SATs, but subject tests. And not many colleges require them anymore. But just so you know, the subject tests, they're also offered the same day as the SAT. And these are one hour tests. And they're specific to certain subject areas. So they have a, um, you know, like a US history subject test, a world history, math, uh, chemistry, biology. So they have a variety of subject tests. And you can take up to three subject tests in, in one sitting, in one day. Um, we do have some students that will participate in the subject tests, maybe because they really feel like they're strong in a particular subject area and they want to showcase that ability, so they'll take the subject test. Um, if a student's, say, in honors biology or honors chemistry and they're really you know, doing a great job, but they don't plan on taking anything beyond that, maybe they want to try and show their skill level and take a subject test. Um, and for colleges that require a subject test, um, students can just take an ACT and they actually, because it's a little bit more subject oriented, the ACT, a student in lieu of SAT subject test could actually just take an ACT and they wouldn't need the subject test. So that's kind of the comparison that we have here. Um, again, we don't have as many students taking the subject test that, that we used to because of the changes to the SAT uh, in colleges telling us they don't really look at them anymore. So we have fewer students taking those, those tests. Okay, does anyone have any questions on standardized testing? I figure I can answer some now. Because the ACT is more subject oriented, the test itself is more subject oriented. So, yes. Yes. How long does it take to get the results? Usually about uh, two to three weeks, uh, probably closer to three weeks. You can put a rush on the scores and pay extra. We don't really find that is necessary uh, for our students that are applying early action or early decision. Um, I think someone will be talking about that a little later. But, uh, usually you need to be done with all the testing by October of senior year, all right? So, because the deadlines would be in November. So usually like three weeks or so. That's a great question. So the question was, if they take both, do they submit both? So junior year, you don't want to submit anything, all right? So when you fill out your SAT registration form or ACT registration form, is someone else talking about this or, or no? I don't, want to, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. Um, so you wouldn't want to submit anything in junior year. But senior year, you can then decide which SAT or ACT, which, you want, which school, um, test you want to send. Maybe you want to send both, one or the other. Um, but for example, with SAT, if you take an SAT now and then an SAT in the fall and you submit the scores in fall, they're going to, in the fall, they're going to get both scores. All right. But what will happen is call, most colleges now super score. In fact, we were at Holy Cross and um, the admissions representative told us they have software that once the SAT scores come in, you know, from say it's from May and October, their software just populates the highest in each section. So for example, if you scored a 500 on the English SAT in May, and then a 650 in the following year in October, they will take the higher score. So wait until senior year to decide where to, which test to use and where to send it. 
Okay, I am gonna hand it off to Mrs. Leary. Hi, everyone. So factors we've gone over so far, transcript and test scores. The next one we'll talk about is letters of recommendation. Um, we haven't gotten into too much detail with juniors about letters, um, but we do have them start brainstorming about who to ask. A couple general rules of thumb are um, sticking to junior year teachers and then possibly even senior year teachers. Um, and, and we usually, usually three is a good magic number for letters of recommendation when you're asking people. Um, so we have a list of do's and don'ts here. Um, it, many, many colleges now actually require a letter from the guidance counselor. So we are writing 40 to 50 letters per year. Um, some, some teachers write up to 20, 25 letters um, per year. Um, so it is a lot. We ask students to meet with us often and communicate with us, and we have forms that they have to fill out in order for us to write a letter for them. We will go over that process um, with them, um, but it's good for the students to get to know us and, um, because it makes those letters much easier to write and you know, more truthful, and we can really tell a lot about the student. And little anecdotes are helpful as well. Uh, we tell students to, to focus on teachers in major subject areas. So that doesn't mean they can't ask a teacher from an elective class, but that should really be viewed as sort of an extra letter. Um, really, they want core, teachers from core subject areas, junior and senior year. We always recommend asking the teacher or the counselor in person, not through email. Um, and if, if you could encourage students as well um, to to talk to teachers and ask them in person and then thank them at the end of all of this because teachers don't have to write letters, they do this on their own time um, and it is, it is a time consuming process. Um, students should give ample notice, so at least one month notice um, and some teachers will have separate requirements. Um, for example, there is an e English teacher in the building who asks students to write um, a little essay to request their letter from her. Um, and then other teachers might have their own forms that um, they would like students to fill out. Students may ask people from outside of BHS for, uh, you know, a boss at work or a dance instructor or things like that. But again, that should be considered an extra letter. It shouldn't be one of the main letters. Um, teachers, in the, any staff um, at BHS who write letters, upload them directly to Naviant so they are considered confidential. Um, right from the start, students cannot ask five different people and then re and, and think that they can read them all and then select the best three. It doesn't work that way. Um, some don'ts, um, don't get too many letters, which is kind of what I just said. Um, don't, they're all confidential, so never expect to read one. Um, and don't assume the most effective letter comes from the class in which you got the highest grade. Um, there are, I've had students who have asked teachers um, where it, maybe it was a class they were initially struggling in and maybe even considered dropping a level for that subject area, but then they, they plowed through, they stuck with it. And that, that in itself is a great story that the teacher can tell for college admissions. Um, like I said, a coach or outside person is never a substitute for an academic letter. It's extra. And I think that's it. So the next. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have touched upon the timeline for that. We haven't gotten into too much d detail. Um, we, we usually recommend asking at the end of this year or the beginning of senior year. In some cases, students have asked teachers at the end of this year and they've told them to come back in the fall, the first week of school, because they, just, they don't write them over the summer or anything like that. But we do start telling uh, juniors that they can be asking at the end of this year. Um, so the next factor is the activity list. So this is one of the few assignments that the guidance counselors do with their students. And um, students are asked to, juniors are asked to submit this to uh, Google Classroom toward, um, more toward, usually toward April. Um, it is not to be confused with a resume. We do give the students a template. It is a detailed list of experiences from high school. So no middle school experiences. However, students may add 
you know, if they've been doing Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or dance for almost their whole life, then they can indicate that. Um, but really, they're steering clear of, of in, um, activities from middle school. Uh, we do encourage students to make it presentable. We, ha like I said, we have a template. It, it should emphasize leadership, accomplishments, duties. Um, these are kind of just some details we'll provide with them later. Our students, I, in my opinion, have gotten better about not having inappropriate e email addresses. They're all creating, they seem to be creating professional ones that they specifically use, use for college purposes, which is good. Um, and so every, many students, um, I will say, when, when this is a, a, um, an assignment for my students, I don't get 100% of them turned in. And I think some students are worried that maybe theirs is too short, and they shouldn't be worried about that. Everyone will have a different length of an activity list. It should, sticking to one page is best, um, but going more than two pages is unnecessary. And every student will have to create one if they plan to apply for uh, one of our local scholarships a year from now, at this time next year. So it is a good thing for them to complete and have on hand. And we get asked for them in the spring for um, awards such as junior book awards. Uh, there's a superintendent's award. So we like to have them on hand. So the next factor is the college essay, um, which students often agonize over, but they do have support. Uh, we recommend that they start a draft over the summer Many of the um, English teachers senior year are now, have now incorporated this into their senior year curriculum, um, so they do work on it, but we don't recommend relying on um, that assignment and relying on, on the teacher for senior year. Um, so starting a draft over the summer is a great idea. Um, the common application essay questions you can find on Google. So although students haven't created a common application account yet to be able to view those prompts, you can Google them. There are six prompts, and then number seven is topic of your choice. So it is pretty wide open. And we do typically have a college essay day that's sponsored by NHS. Um, in the past, sometimes it's been in the fall, sometimes it's in, in the spring in May. And the application, we can't forget that part of the um, whole process. So the common application for those of you who are new to this, who ha don't have older chil children who have been through this process, um, it is one application that can be sent to multiple colleges. So hundreds of colleges are, um, throughout the country accept this application. It makes their lives much easier, especially easier, you know, much easier than we, when we were in high school. Um, it is made up of the application and then some supplements, which might be an additional page or two required by certain colleges where they have, the student has to answer some additional questions that might be short answer questions. It might be another um, um, essay that they have to do as well in some cases. And it's also made up of the payment for the application fee. So this, when the student clicks submit, they will be prompted to pay an application fee for each college as well. It can be found at commonapp.org. The meetings that we have with juniors, um, as we get closer to spring, we will actually have our juniors create a Common App account and get started on their Common Application. Um, there, for the colleges who do not accept the Common Application, they have their own private applications that you have to access on the individual college websites, um, and those typically aren't available until the fall, uh, the fall of senior year. So this one you can access early in junior year. And college admissions options. Uh, so you'll hear a lot about this. Regular decision, often referred to as RD. Um, those are the traditional deadlines that occur January 1st, January 15th, February 1st, February 15th, and so forth. Um, early action is non-binding, so it's a way of applying early in senior year. It's typically November 1st, November 15th. Um, it's a way of applying early and getting an early decision from the college, um, typically around December vacation, um, students find out. Now, when you apply this uh, through this method, 
you really should have strong grades through the end of junior year. If, if a student wants to showcase more of their senior year to prove themselves a little bit further, then, then applying early typically is not for you. Then you should wait, get your grades up a little bit, and have more to show on your transcript to the colleges. Early decision, not to be confused with action. This is the binding one. So this is when a student has a, a top choice school that they know that they can afford, that they've fallen in love with. Um, they have to sign a contract. They sign it, parents have to sign it, and then the guidance counselor has to sign it. And if accepted, the student has to retract any other applications they've sent out in the meantime. And they're expected to attend that college. And then rolling admission, you might hear that one. So it's not a set deadline where um, they start, the college starts reviewing all the applications after that deadline. Uh, the school reviews applications as they are received. Um, and so the earlier the better with that, definitely. And then you do get a decision back from the college um, pretty quickly, I, I think, with rolling admissions. And now we're back to Ms. Wotowski. So these are some logos from our state university systems and the UMass system. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the admissions process for our, our local universities. So for students that have a GPA below a 3.0, so that's below that B, they must meet a minimum requirement on our sliding scale, on the state sliding scale. Now SAT scores on the sliding scale only include the reading and the math. They don't include the writing portion. And we really want to encourage students, like for example, UMass um, Lowell has said that they're test optional, but not for all programs. For example, nursing or engineering, they're not optional. So you have to really take a look at each university ind individually, go to their websites and look at the programs that you're interested in. Always check the websites. So the top graph in your packet, if you take a look at, the, the top portion is the UMass system. So the SAT requirements and the sliding scale, if you look at the first, the first section, 2.5 to 2.9, your GPA, the combined score that they're looking at is at 1030. And if you look at the graph below, this is the state system, so your Framingham, your Fitchburg, your Worcester, your Westfield is a little bit lower. Between the 2.5 and the 2.9, it's a 9.90. So this is, for, again, for students that meet that, that are below the 3.0 GPA. So joint admissions, for students, there's a variation of the, the, many reasons why students might start at a community college. Maybe it's financial, maybe they need a little bit more time. Um, the transfer process is very easy. It's, it's a really smooth process. So for students that don't attend a four-year college directly and choose to go, a go to a community college, if they maintain a GPA of a 2.5, which is a C, they can automatically transfer except to UMass Art. Those requirements are a little bit different. Um, this eliminates the, the process of completing another application and the state college, um, the, the community college system is really good at working with students to transfer after one year or after two years. Many students will do two years in a community college and then transfer to a four-year college and you're sort of getting the price of a four-year university paying the two years. So it's, it's a really great opportunity. Um, let's see, if a GPA is a 3.0 or higher at the community college level, then students are eligible for a tuition, reimburse, a tuition um, discount. So you're doing really well at a community college, you can get some benefits at the four-year college that you transfer to. Students with disabilities. So if a student has a documented disability, they're an I, they have an IEP or a 504, we encourage you to please have that discussion with your guidance counselor if you want to share that information with the college. It's a very individualized process. You can share the information or not. Some of the sort of positives is that you're not sort of painted with the same brush as everyone else. They take a look at your testing, they take a look at your strengths, and then the areas that you might need some support services. But every college is a little bit different. So you need to share the information with them in order for them to come up with a plan that works for you. It is not an automatic process. So whatever your accommodations you had at the high school setting won't automatically transfer to a college setting. 
but please discuss this with your guidance counselor. And what's wonderful about all schools, there's some sort of support. And some schools are known for individualized tutoring, so every school has writing, math, and you know, services that are available to everybody. NCAA, um, for the athletic eligibility, if a student is thinking of playing a Division I or Division II sports, they have to register with the NCAA. So that's a very different process than the Division III athlete. And all the requirements are on the website. And um, also, please talk to your guidance counselor because that process is, is a little bit unique. So that's only for Division I and Division II athletes. Okay. So a gap year. We've talked about so many different options, but the gap year is one that has really um, taken more movement over the years. It's, it's a year after high school that is taken um, intentionally as, as a time in between. So many students will apply to college, they'll do the regular process and decide that, you know, maybe I'm gonna take a year off and I'm gonna volunteer, I'm gonna do um, program a program abroad, I wanna do a, a language immersion, I wanna do a work exchange program, program and then they defer and go to college the following year and on our blog the guidance blog is an incredible resource we have a list of gap year options so what can parents do to help you can do a lot but this is a little breakdown on what are the things that the sort of the most important things that we've seen over the years do let your students sort of take charge lead on so every, by the time, you know, you, you have so many people talking to your child about college, their future plans, it's constant. You do want to be there for them, but you want them to be the ones leading the charge and saying, this is what I want, this is what I'm looking for. You do want to, however, discuss the restrictions like we talked about earlier. So by the time they leave here, they're going to have a list of prospective colleges. And you obviously should know what those are, meaning by the end of junior year. And if... Hawaii is not an option, if Florida is not an option, if California is not an option, please let them know that up front. Um, when you look at, of course, the college cost is something we all think about, but it's difficult to assess how much money you're going to get. So as we talked about having a list that is varied, you have your reach schools, your safety schools, you also want to have a very list when it comes to the financial piece. Some state schools, some private schools, and then when you do make the decision on where to go, you have the financial piece up front. So having a balanced list financial-wise is also important. Please do help your students um, with, with deadlines. However, we do want you to pick a day during the week. Students tell us that they're overwhelmed with adults in their lives constantly asking them about, about school. So if you decide as a family, what day works for you? Maybe it's a Sunday that in the afternoon you talk about where are we with the college piece? You know, how, how are you doing? Did you pick your two teachers to talk to? Which schools do we want to visit during April vacation? Or what's our plan for this week? So you know that there's one set time that your child is, knows that this is the conversation that you're gonna have, but they're not gonna be bombarded every day. It's, it's really a tough time because everyone is having this conversation. They, they don't get a break from it. So decide what works for you as a family. Um, another thing is do not create your students' accounts for them. It is really tough for us when we're working with them and we say, can you pull up your Common App? Oh, I don't know my login. I don't know my password. I have to call my mom. I have to call my dad. So it's important that they are the ones, again, leading the charge, they know their accounts, and they know how to get into them. And, let's, and also uh, college visits. Obviously, we want to encourage you to use February vacation, April vacation, obviously summertime in the fall to visit schools to, for the students to realize, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable in larger schools. Maybe I want a middle, you know, mid-side school or a smaller school. And a lot of times, visiting now, helps them keep going because they think about, they see what's at the end. They see the goal at the end and it pushes them to, to go that extra mile academically. All right, and back to Mr. Adubato. So, uh, you know, we, again, we've covered a lot of information. Um, hopefully I can uh, hold your attention for a little while longer when the final stretch here and then we'll open it up at the end for some questions. Um, just some things that, you, juniors, that we really wanna make sure these things are done or in process going into the summer. 
uh, again, through Naviance, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have created a list of colleges, a prospective list of colleges, and it's, it's stored and maintained through the Naviance program. Parents can access it and students can access it, so you have that list. It keeps everything nice and uniform. Um, you'll see the deadlines, everything's pretty clear. The program really spells it out for you. You heard Mrs. Larry talk about uh, the activity list and teacher recommendations. Um, you have a wealth of information in the red packets. One of the pieces of information in there that you can take a look at later, and I would suggest you find a time to go through that packet, but is a, uh, a uh, teacher questionnaire form. Is that the right terminology for the form? There's a, there's a form that we ask students to fill out when they're requesting a letter. I know Mrs. Larry mentioned it, but again, that's in your packet. So that's in relation to the recommendations. Uh, counselors, so this is when Again, why it's good to have a good relationship with your counselor, we are gonna be writing a letter of recommendation for you in the fall, all right? So we actually will give you some information. Some counselors will do it this later in the spring or very early in next fall. We're gonna be writing a letter for you too. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that you uh, fill out a questionnaire for us. Common App, again, you heard about that. We're gonna want you to create the Common Application account. Close to 1,000 colleges now participate in Common App one application and you can, you can send your common application to a number of different colleges and universities. So again, there's a, obviously a huge benefit there. <clears throat> so this is not a financial aid night. We're just gonna kind of briefly go over a couple of things. Just so you're aware, uh, we do have a financial aid event in June, June 13th. We'll have a representative uh, from MIFA, the Massachusetts Educational Financial Authority. They'll come in and they're gonna talk about financial aid. Uh, and so you're gonna start to hear some terminology. If you've had some older children that have gone to Burlington High and gone off to college, again, you've probably heard of uh, the FAFSA form, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but through the FAFSA form, it's a, it's a financial aid form. By filling out this form, the federal government's gonna determine whether or not you qualify for any state or federal aid, uh, financial aid. Financial aid can be free money, meaning you know, a grant, or you can qualify for different kinds of loans. Again, this is through the federal government. Students need to fill out a FAFSA in order to be eligible or to see if you are eligible for um, any kind of aid. Again, loans can be subsidized or unsubsidized, meaning you pay the interest at a later time. Uh, and then through the, through the FAFSA form, you could potentially qualify for something called work study in college, meaning they help line up a job for you when you get to college, and that money can be used as part of a financial aid package. Yep. So um, there's two forms that you're really gonna wanna become familiar with. Uh, one is, I'm gonna say the FAFSA, even though it's second up there, I'm gonna say that first. Again, that's a document that you fill out. In the end, it probably only takes about a half hour to 45 minutes. It doesn't take long, but it's gonna ask you some personal information, and then the government will do a calculation, uh, and they'll give you a number called an EFC, an Estimated Family Contribution. Um, and so what this EFC number is, it's essentially what the federal government says you can afford for college, okay? And they try to potentially meet your need if there is a need, okay? Again, that's called the EFC, uh, the FAFSA website, uh, and you can find other websites that you can get an estimated EFC. A lot of colleges now provide information on um, average financial aid packages based on income. Naviance has a feature that allows you to do that as well. So again, FAFSA, federal and state aid. The other document is the CSS profile. Oh, just on the FAFSA, just as an FYI. This, as of last year, uh, so previously the FAFSA would become available uh, January 1st of the student senior year, all right? And that's when parents started filling out the form, January 1. They changed that last year. It's now available October 1, okay? So that kind of changed the whole financial aid calendar. So please keep that in mind. It will be available next October. If you fill it out and submit it now, it's, it's, you don't wanna do that because it, doesn't have, it won't apply to your child. Wait until October 1. Um, the CSS profile, this is a financial aid form not required by colleges or universities, 
Um, several colleges do ask you to fill it out. And it's basically, this document <clears throat> asks even more questions. This one takes a little longer. This is specifically for private schools that would like to offer, that could potentially offer you institutional funds of that particular college, okay? So that's not federal or state money, it's through the actual college. Uh, you heard about early decision, so sometimes early decision students don't get their full financial aid package, but along with your early decision ap application, oftentimes they're gonna tell you they want you to fin f uh, complete the profile because they wanna try to give you the best guess financial aid estimate for um, if you're applying early decision. All right, so those are the two forms that you really wanna make sure you're aware of. Uh, parents and students, obviously, are gonna be hearing this terminology as well. So we do have financial aid events throughout the course of the school year. For junior parents, certainly uh, this June, you wanna attend that evening. Again, we'll have a representative here to get really into the nitty gritty financial aid information. We have something called, uh, oh, and then we'll have a financial aid night again in the early fall, uh, and it's specifically for senior parents, okay? So you have two opportunities to get information. And then we have something called FAFSA Day, um, and we don't know what the date is, but it's probably gonna be next fall. Uh, historically, in previous years, we've done it on a Sunday, but this year we started doing it during the week. So really it's a FAFSA night, but essentially what happens there is we have financial aid. Um, it, folks come from all around. We have uh, you know, the financial aid director from BC, uh, Northeastern's here, Mass College of Pharmacy, several other local um, college financial aid folks. They, they come into the high school, they make themselves available to parents and students that have questions on financial aid. This year we probably had about 60 or so uh, folks come into the school. It's not just Burlington, it's kind of a regional effort, but we had uh, parents and students come in from all different communities. A lot of people brought their own laptops and they, they actually completed their FAFSA right then and there and submitted it. So you can get some live help on that, on that FAFSA day. Again, this year we ended up having it second week in December, but next year it's probably gonna be October, November, okay? So this is basically where the money's coming from. As I had mentioned, the FAFSA gives you federal and state aid, uh, the CSS profile, college and universities, and then, you know, again, financial aid can come from private agencies. Local scholarship, you've probably heard about um, the variety of different scholarship programs through uh, the town of Burlington, the Burlington Community Scholarship Foundation. Uh, you've probably heard of Adopt-A-Class. And then we have lots and lots of, of local folks that, and local organizations that contribute different kinds of scholarships. You can get real detailed information on the guidance blog. Um, last year, all total, it was close to $400,000 that was given to last year's senior class. All right, that's a lot of, obviously it's a lot of money. Um, it, again, um, this was uh, a combination of all the different scholarships offered. So we're talking, um, you know, local, age, local uh, groups like youth lacrosse, youth soccer, youth basketball. And then we have the Knights of Columbus. We have lots of people that have uh, memorial scholarships based on a loved one that's passed away. Uh, we have community service-based scholarships, which would be Adopt-A-Class. Several other scholarships. So again, if you wanted to view what scholarships were given last year, you can check out the guidance blog. Seniors, we're, we're getting ready for this now with seniors, but there's, students need to fill out applications in order to qualify for these scholarships. So again, students really need to pay attention to scholarship applications. We start posting them for the, for the ju current juniors, like this summer we'll start to post uh, some scholarship applications. But really, right around now, senior year, is when you'll really start to see um, the applications start rolling in. I'm gonna talk about the MCAS scholarships really quick. Uh, so there are two different types of um, MCAS scholarships. One is the John and Abigail Adams scholarship. So you all took MCAS. Um, and sometime in the fall of senior year, the state uh, does a calculation and they're gonna take the top 25% of MCAS scores within Burlington High School. So not state, but just within our own school. Top 25%. And then those students get a letter, and 
the letter is basically uh, allows you to get a tuition waiver to any mass public college or university. Okay, so the UMass system, we know uh, Boston, Lowell, uh, Dartmouth, and Amherst, and then there's several state universities. Um, again, keep in mind, it's a tuition waiver, so tuition's usually about 2,000 to 2,500 per year. So that's waived. Room board and fees is probably like 20 to 25,000. So again, it's only about 2,000 per year, but with the, with the cost of education now, I think, you know, obviously anything's a saving, so that, that would be $8,000 potentially over four years because it's renewable if you keep a, a 3.0. So that student just needs to score in the top 25%. You get a letter. You wouldn't know about that till probably October, November of next year. Doesn't apply to private schools, just to state schools. Then we also have the Coplick Award. So this would be for a student that scored advanced on one of the three MCAS. We have an English, we have math, and we have science. Student needs to score advanced on one and at least proficient on the other two. Advanced on one, proficient on the other two. That makes you qualify initially. In addition to that, you need to do what's kind of spelled out here. That is, you need to score, um, you need to take two exams, either two AP exams or two SAT subject exams. You heard me mention subject test. This is the reason why students would take it. Uh, or you take one AP exam and one subject exam, okay? And, or you just take one of the two tests, you take either AP or a subject test, and you can replace one of the test requirements with, you've heard dual enrollment, you could use a dual enrollment course, a college course, or an academic or artistic award, okay? There's often questions on this. I'm the COPPA coordinator at the school. Feel free to email a call if you have specific questions. Uh, this information, let's see, we, for juniors, um, we should be mailing that out pretty, pretty soon, before the springtime, all right? So juniors, you should know, actually, you know by the, by the scores as well. If you got advanced on one and at least proficient on the other two, then, then you, you know, you've qualified. But we at the school will mail home an application. But you could Google this and, and, and take a look at the application. So this one's the Coplick. Um, a lot of students wait to see if they get the Adams you know, before they do the Coplick, or, or some students want, the, want to know they can get that tuition waiver right away. You, it's definitely a discussion you want to have with your, your guidance counselor. And um, use caution, so, you know, you're going to be offered maybe uh, the opportunity to pay someone to do your FAFSA form. That's certainly up to you. It is a form that could be managed and handled on your own or through uh, free. It, if you, can, you could probably handle it uh, on your own, but again, we just want you to be aware that you don't necessarily have to pay for those things. Um, and then when completing online financial aid information, just make sure the FAFSA, you use the correct website. Um, I had a student that went online and filled out the entire FAFSA form and then was asked for um, $90 payment. And as I was talking to her, I said, $90? Like you, you were actually charged 90 and, and she paid? She said, yeah. I said, well, that's a free application. So she, what happened is she went to, I think it was FAFSA.com and filled everything out. And basically, she was filling information out for a third party. That third party took her information and filed the FAFSA for her. So um, we called and we told them there was some confusion because I, I felt bad. I recall it was like her entire paycheck. Uh, and I think they ultimately ended up only giving her half her money back. So... In any event, that's just a story for you to be aware of. Just make sure you, when you fill out the FAFSA, it's fafsa.gov, uh, I believe. Okay, so again, we're closing, closing down here. So just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, we have a couple uh, breakfasts coming up. Um, the end of the month, we're going to have a course selection process breakfast for parents. And basically, that breakfast will cover the same exact thing we're going to talk about Monday with the students, okay? And in June, we'll have a, a breakfast for parents. And it's really going to be specifically for some of the things you're going to be doing over the summer as, as juniors. And uh, one other thing what's not listed here is potentially I'm trying to see if we can do some sort of college application boot camp this summer. I don't know if any seniors would 
be interested in that, but it would be, I'm, I'm looking to do something in mid-August uh, as a day for uh, rising seniors to come in and do some college-specific work to make senior a little bit easier. Uh, I've talked to the English department. We're, we're really trying to get this going. I'll, I posted on the blog if it's gonna happen, but we'd have an English teacher here to help with essay writing, a guidance counselor here to help with uh, the college process, so keep your eyes out for that. Again, you have a packet of information that is, uh, has quite a bit of information, but on the back right and the back left, the very last page on the left and the right, the left-hand side is an evaluation. We would ask you to fill this out for us and leave it on the back table. All right, please um, let us know if there's anything you wish we elaborated on more, um, but we really wanna know, you know kind of what you thought about tonight, give us some, some feedback. Then you've heard us talk about Naviance quite a bit. Parents, you can have accounts if you don't already. Um, if you're not sure, I would still suggest filling out the Naviance sign-up sheet. That's in the back right. Um, and this allows you to view and see everything that your son or daughter sees. Uh, we do ask parents to have their separate, have a separate account. Uh, we like to track how, our, how often our students access the program. We pay for this program. So we like to see how often our students are accessing it and parents as well. So we want to know that, you know, it is a resource that students and parents are taking advantage of. Um, in addition to that, sometimes we'll send emails just to parents and not students. Like for a guidance breakfast, I'm sure the students would want to come for breakfast. Uh, but we really just send it out to parents to remind them. Again, for example, tonight's presentation, we sent out a reminder to parents. Uh, actually, it might have went to the whole class, but... In any event, we really like parents to have their own accounts. Fill this out and leave that with us, and we'll take care of that. You'd probably get an auto email tomorrow or Friday with a username and password, okay? So that wraps up the night. I'm more than willing to stick around to answer any questions. Uh, and, you know, in addition to that, you can always email your son or daughter's guidance counselor if you have any questions. But